All right, Kishore. Go ahead, Manu. Great, thank you so much. Um, and thanks to Shamla for that wonderful presentation. And I'm so happy that Shamla, you went into all the detail because my presentation is much shorter. So, you know, uh, hopefully everybody will be able to tie the two and, and uh, get all the answers, um, you know, that you need from Shamla's presentation. Um, and I, I really also identified with what Shamla was saying about, you know, um, not being able to read books in the recent few years, I've had a really hard time um, trying to, you know, get myself to read books. I used to be a very voracious reader, but read mostly fiction. Um, but in the past few years, I was not even interested in reading fiction and I was finding it really hard to really read. So I'm so happy to uh, having, you know, gotten back to reading and doing so with the Gita. <clears throat> So, um, you know, I'm just going to start by uh, reminiscing a little bit. And uh, my, my husband and I have a favorite dosa place. It's, uh, it's a little hole in the wall place. It has a few, you know, tables and chairs for you to sit and have your dosa. And it has a couple pictures on the wall. And really, we never paid attention to anything, you know, about the place other than the food, because the food is awesome. Um, and we've been going there for many years. And then, you know, the kids came along and we started going there with the kids. And uh, of course they started noticing things, right? Because kids notice everything. And uh, there was this picture on the wall of Lord Krishna as a baby um, eating yogurt out of a pot. And the children were really curious about, you know, they, they called him the blue baby because you know, that's how he's presented in these uh, pictures. And uh, they would all often ask me about, you know, why, why is the baby blue? And, you know, tell us, you know, tell us about this blue baby. And so I, I started telling them stories about Lord Krishna that I remembered thanks to Amar Chitrakata and watching the Mahabharata and all this stuff. So, you know, I, was, I, I used to tell them the stories, but then I also realized that perhaps I didn't know as much myself that I need to also be, you know, improving my own uh, knowledge of, of these stories. So on subsequent trips to India, I um, came across, you know, uh, the Gita for Children by Rupa Pai and uh, another book uh, called My Gita by Devdat Patnaik that I found these uh, in the airport bookstore and I was like, oh, this is great. You know, I, uh, the kids can uh, get started on reading the Gita. Perhaps I can also get started and, you know, we can all have uh, some better understanding of this topic that I'm not very familiar with. And uh, unfortunately, didn't quite work out that way. I bought the books, but they just sat on the shelf for many years. Um, and then came 2020. And with it came the pandemic, you know, and all the anxieties and fears related to that. And as well as, uh, you know, in, at the same time in the US, we had the BLM movement that started to get violent. We had the very uh, negatively charged um, election campaigns. And all of this was, you know, creating uh, an, an atmosphere of negativity, uh, cause for anxiety. And it really made me very uneasy. Um, I couldn't figure out, you know, how do I make sense of all this that is going on and try to calm myself down. And, and it was at this time that I felt like these books that I had bought were beckoning to me. And I, I started reading one of those. Um, books on the Gita. And uh, as I started reading it, I felt really good. I, I felt that it was, um, you know, uh, validating some of my thought processes. There were some very quick aha moments. And so uh, it really, um, you know, made me want to read more. Uh, but unfortunately, it still continued to be slow going. And and now, you know, I realize that it is so important to have this kind of forum 
to discuss these thoughts and the, the, the learnings because it clarifies things in your mind. And I, I think that that's one of the reasons you're able to go a little bit faster than you would otherwise if you were reading on your own. So one day, like seemingly out of nowhere, as I was talking to Shelly, she asked me, oh, do you want to join a Gita study group with Alpna and Anupama? And I was so amazed because I had not shared with Shelly that I was trying to read the Gita. So it sort of came out of nowhere. And I felt like, you know, the universe is conspiring to make this happen for me. And, and I jumped at the opportunity. And it, it's been really such a blessing to be part of this group. We started, um, you know, this is the smaller group that we started about six months ago, starting to read it together and, you know, uh, come up to speed with some of the concepts so we could join the larger group. And then one day when Alpna told us that we were ready to join the larger group, we were like so apprehensive because felt so ill-prepared, you know, we were so, so like at the beginning of our journey. But I, I feel like this has been such a, a beautiful experience. Um, I love that, you know, this group is so non-judgmental, so encouraging of beginners like us. And uh, there's so much to learn from all of you people. So I know I have a lot further to go than a lot of you, but I am so excited and so happy to be on this journey and have this forum with all of you where we can you know, discuss and, and, and raise questions and, and get some you know, clarifications. So thank you. Um, so with that, I want to just share a few learnings that I've uh, had over the, few, uh, over the last six months. Uh, and the way I'm trying to you know, put it together is um, how and you know, what do I do and how do I get to the point where my mind becomes more peaceful and calm and open to new learnings. And that is what I'm calling a, a Gita mindset. And um, you know, as we've been learning, uh, re listening to other lectures, etc., I, I really connected with what <clears throat> Swami Paramatmananda Ji said in one of his lectures, where he said that a stressed mind is a burden, but a light mind can be carried and used as an instrument of knowledge. So, with that, let's start. Um, so the first. Uh, piece I want to talk about is a framework for taking action. And it's, it's really about, um, you know, how do we take action? How do we make decisions? And, and this is, again, I'm, I'm talking about it from my point of view. So, you know, it may be very simplistic for some of you, or, or, but I think it really helps um, me and I hope it might help others as well as to how do we take action and how do we deal with the results of those actions. So my first learning is about hitting pause. So Arjun is on the battlefield. He is ready for battle. He has been preparing for it. He knows what's coming. He, he is aware of you know, what he has signed up for. And yet he pre presses pause right before battle and asks Lord Krishna to take his chariot in the middle of the two armies. And I think it, it's, to me, it, it signifies that he recognized or acknowledged a, a turmoil in his mind. It might have been a subconscious thing because, you know, he hasn't really, um, really, you know, articulated that in his mind up until that point in time. But to me, this is the first learning that you have to pause before you take action. And it is so important to take that moment because then you can reflect and introspect on you know, what, what you're about to do. The action you're about to undertake, is it the right action? Is it for the right reasons? So it, you know, Arjun did that, he, he took that, that opportunity to pause, consider the why, what, and how of the action that he was planning to take. Um, and 
importantly, I also wanted to note that Duryodhan did not do that. And he was very confident in what he was about to do. He had absolutely no doubts. But I think when we do have doubts, it is important to engage with them and understand them and see where those doubts are coming from so that we can you know, improve our understanding of what we are about to do. And importantly, we don't wanna be consumed by doubts when we are in the middle of, act, of the action. So whatever doubts, whatever issues we have, I think it's important to acknowledge them, understand them prior to um, getting to the action state. And then um, we evaluate the risks. So what I realized is that, and it happens to all of us, it happens with me, I, I know I'm sure it happens with everybody. We, even when we are reflecting and introspecting, we wanna gloss over the, the risks, the, the things that are really hard to think about because they are, un, they could be unpalatable. You know, they, um, they can make us feel more anxious or uneasy. Uh, so like Arjun, you know, even though he knew that his family and his um, elders are going to be on the other side of the, the battlefield, he had not considered what that meant to him prior to arriving at that you know, in that point in the middle of the uh, battlefield. But Lord Krishna forced him to confront that reality by taking the, uh, the chariot and, you know, to a point where, from where he could actually see those people. And so he, re so he realized that, oh, this is what I'm about to do. How do I feel about this? How, you know, does, is this right? Is this wrong? and evaluating that risk of how it might make him feel if those people were to come to harm helped him clarify the action in his mind. Um, he was able to then make a decision that was right for him and right for his people. So um, from there, you know, then we can, once we have evaluated the risk, we can, um, <clears throat> take action with confidence and full conviction. We can focus on the action itself, not get distracted by potential unpleasant results because now we know why exactly we're doing this and why it is so important to do it. Um, <clears throat> the Gita says that we must focus on our effort, which is prayatna, and at the right time, which is taking into account call. And um, the third factor, Devam, we have to have faith that, you know, given that we are taking action because for all these right reasons that whatever the result will be, will be in our best interest. So, uh, <clears throat> and eventually when we do have the results, we accept graciously. The result is not just, you know, dependent on our effort, the prayatna and the time uh, call, it is also dependent on this unknown third factor. So we should learn to accept these results graciously and with gratitude. There are things that we cannot control and they will have an impact on the end result. And being you know, at peace with that uh, helps us to accept these um, results graciously. I feel like even if the the um, result is not in my favor, like you know, I I uh, don't get the result that I want. There's got to be something in it that is for my benefit, and perhaps it's a learning that I need to you know get from from my um, my experience that was not, didn't prove to be the you know didn't prove out the way I wanted to it to be. So uh, here, you know, I, I think of it, I, I'm an avid gardener. I think of it in sort of a gardening analogy, which is, you know, I'm prepping my soil, I'm planting my seedlings at the right time. I'm taking care of uh, my garden by watering it and, you know, caring for it. And yet sometimes I may not get the results of all my labor because, you know, there was a freak late season frost or there was, you know, the squirrels came and got it before I did. And, and so if I just start blaming myself or the squirrels, I mean, it's not gonna help. 
So what can I do to help myself? I think the, the next time around when I replan my garden, what can I do? Maybe I should be looking at the weather forecast more carefully so I can protect my garden from these unseasonal frosts or you know, maybe I need to plant a separate little garden for the squirrels so that they don't come and eat all my produce. So it, it gives me a chance to, uh, you know, do something maybe a little bit differently because um, I don't get so caught up in why, you know, it happened to turn out the way it did, which was not what I wanted. So having faith that the result is in my best interest and being grateful for that, which is Prasad Buddhi, brings a lot of peace to the mind and it also helps me to get up and try again and perhaps make a little changes, few tweaks here and there. And basically I can start this process or the cycle of you know, pause, introspect, evaluate, act and accept over again. Um, and I find that the cycle uh, is useful for <clears throat> not just, you know, um, like important big decisions, but also in the moment, right? Whether it's a, it's something somebody said to you that you didn't like and how do you react to that versus, you know, uh, an ongoing work situation that is creating anxiety. I think it helps with all those kinds of big and small uh, situations. The other uh, framework, if you will, that I wanted to talk about is, um, how to deal with things that go on in this world. And it's almost like a framework for self-improvement. Um, and the, the first thing here is, who am I, right? It, this is a favorite phrase in the Gita um, it, and it's a key learning of the Gita. So we peel away the layers of the onion <clears throat> to reveal that the real eye or also called the fundamental eye is this awareness that is limitless and that is present in each one of us. <clears throat> so it's a, this is a very large concept. And um, one way to get around this, you know, thinking about this large concept and making it uh, easier to separate the, the body-mind complex from this limitless awareness is to try to think of myself in the third person. I feel like this can help create, um, it, it can help create a separation between this body-mind complex and, and the uh, awareness. And then perhaps I, I, maybe I am the director of this, you know, movie of life in which this third person is my star character. And it, it, this is the only character that I'm able to control. So I am, you know, uh, and, and this character is then sharing the stage with all these other characters over whom I don't have any control. Um, but, you know, I have to make it such that my character can move through the stage with, um, it, in the right way, creating, you know, the right kind of experiences for, um, himself, herself, itself, or, you know, and as well as for others. So it's like a multiplayer game. Uh, you know, this is my avatar. I'm sharing the stage with so many other avatars and, and we're trying to all, you know, get through this, this game of life. Um, but I, I feel like this helps me to create that separation. And all, once in a often, you know, once in a while I can, sit back and say, okay, what is this person doing? And is this the right thing that this person is doing? A another way to think about this, and this is really, you know, sort of I thought of it in terms of an identity crisis, right? So um, who am I? You know, I, I was, uh, I had a certain identity before I was married and I was very strongly attached to that identity. I was very proud of that identity. And um, at that time, I often, you know, wondered how women would change their name after marriage, because um, like, how can you lose your identity, right? But when I did get married, I had like absolutely no second thoughts about changing my name. And I feel like subconsciously, 
I was aware that, you know, I'm merging into this larger entity and my identity is changing to, you know, encompass this larger entity. So it, it was very obvious and natural. And, you know, like I said, no second thoughts about doing that. Um, and now when I think about, you know, this even larger entity, uh, the, the limitless awareness, maybe if I think about it in a similar way that, you know, if, if I'm merging with a larger identity, I, I can give up um, my current, what the identity I, you know, I use right now, it makes it a little easier for me to sort of think about it. Um, I'm not fully there yet, of course, but you know, I'm, I'm trying to put in a framework for myself that can help me uh, understand these large concepts and try to you know, move towards them. The second uh, concept is uh, less is more, right? Shamla just talked about reducing likes and dislikes, which is again, another key learning of the Gita. We wanna find a neutral zone and when these likes and dislikes are neutralized, we become less concerned with gathering material things. Uh, and I, I read this quote by um, the author of Becoming Minimalist, his name is Joshua Becker. And he said that desiring less is even more important than owning less. And, and that really sort of made sense to me. You know, we have to get to the point where we are desiring less. And so um, the Gita helps us understand that desiring material objects or, and, and uh, you know, getting hold of material objects can only bring happiness for a limited period of time. But the real happiness is attained only through self-knowledge and this real happiness is limitless, right? Uh, and we can help get there by reducing our likes and dislikes. And then um, the last piece is be good, right? You wanna be good. The Gita talks about the 20 values that we should aim for that Shamla nicely put in a slide for us. Um, these 20 values can prepare the mind for learning and they're referred to as the means of knowledge. These include, you know, absence of pride, amanitvam, straightforwardness, arjavam, non-injury, ahimsa, or, or steadfastness, sterium, and, and all the others, right? But becoming great at all 20 all at once is, is quite overwhelming as, as a goal. And so we need to start somewhere. And I feel like if we pick up couple and start like, like you know, uh, we heard from Shamla, they're all very interrelated. You start somewhere, you'll start seeing an impact on the others as well, slowly. <clears throat> and I think of it as, um, you know, untangling a, a, a tangled ball of yarn. If, once you start unknotting it in one spot, and, you know, you, once you start there, you will be able to eventually untangle the whole ball, ball of yarn. And so why do we do all this? And, and why should we, you know, um, aspire to all this. And I, I feel like, you know, by embracing the teachings of the Gita and trying to practice living them, the mind becomes stronger. And there comes a sense not only of peace, but also of being powerful. Powerful over your own emotions and in mental state. So previously, you know, um, negative experiences would invoke a why me response, right? Which, which create a feeling of victimhood. So you believe that somebody else, some other power is doing something to you that you don't like and you feel powerless to change anything uh, because you know, they are doing it and, and poor me. So um, these can invoke feelings of, you know, in two ways, these, can these feelings can manifest in one of two ways, right? Either it's depression, anxiety, you know, uh, uneasiness, nervousness, when you, when you turn these feelings inwards. Or it can lead to anger, frustration, rage, revenge, kind of feelings, 
if you turn it outwards. And neither one of these is really a, a good place to be. It both can only bring further angst. So by understanding the teachings of the Gita, I, I learned to have faith that whatever is happening to me is happening for a larger reason. I understand that there is no power doing something to me. I am doing it to myself. You know, I am respond by responding in the way I'm responding. I am creating that anxiety and, and um, feeling of uneasiness in myself. So I understand um, that it's only I who can then change the situation by changing my response. So now I feel powerful instead of feeling victimized. I feel powerful that I can control my emotions and not respond negatively to the negative experiences. So I'm not falling victim to victimhood anymore. And the question of why me, just, it just fades away. It doesn't even come up. You know, and that brings an immense sense of freedom and relief. And um, I think that is, to me, the biggest benefit of going through this journey, at least at this point in time, you know, where I am. It is bringing me a lot of um, calm and peace and the sense of being powerful over my own emotions. And then finally, you know, I'm just going to leave you with a, a quote by Mahatma Gandhi about the Gita, which I think is so, I mean, he, he just got it right, right? Um, he said that the Gita is the universal mother. She turns away nobody. Her door is wide open to anyone who knocks. And then he goes on to say that peace and joy comes not to the skeptic or to him who is proud of his intellect or learning. It is reserved only for the humble in spirit who bring to her worship a fullness of faith and an undivided singleness of mind. There was never a man who worshiped her in the spirit and went back disappointed. Thank you everyone. <laughs>